Hey everybody, welcome to Intro to Clay. I'm Lynn Wood and today we're going to get started by talking about setting up your workspace and for the beginning we'll be talking about what tools that you need to get started. A basic pair of scissors, a small sponge of some type, a fork that will be used for scoring and we'll talk more about that, a wooden spoon, you need something to use as a rib, and what I have here as examples are uh, gift cards that I've taken from one of the local stores. An old credit card also works. You'll need a knife of some kind, and the knives that I have here are inexpensive knife, paring knives from the dollar store. You could also get an official clay knife that's called a fettling knife. The two that I have here, one is as is from the store, and the other is wrapped in pipe insulation. I used that when I had a hand issue and I needed a wider grip. Either one of these work fine. A pencil's a great tool. If you have one of these great erasers, you can glue that on the end. You'll want a few small paint brushes, a, uh, a cutting string, a cutting string, or you can use fish line, and I'll show you that in a few minutes. Also, a skewer works as a good tool. And this is a chopstick that I sharpened the end of. Some slats for when you roll out your clay, and I'll be demonstrating that a little later. A rolling pin, and the bigger the rolling pin you have, the better. And speaking of rolling pins, you could also have this, which we call a pony roller, but in the rest of the world, they call this a pastry roller, and this very roller can be had from Amazon. However, if you have a big rolling pin and don't want to invest in this, you can get a little one of these, which is a wallpaper seam roller. You can find those online inexpensively, just a couple of bucks, and this one, the brand is Richard's. Good old basic spray bottle. A board to use as what we call a wear board to work on and to store your projects on, and this fancy one is a piece of sheetrock with duct tape binding the edges well used, as you can see. And then I have a bunch of little odd tools for making marks to texture your clay surface. I have a clothespin, a half of a clothespin, a eucalyptus pod, those are great and they're all different, a dried peach pit, a screw, a Lego, a cap from a pen, a top from some dish soap, poke with a circle. This is a cap off a lady's disposable razor. And last but not least, this is actually a chew toy for dogs that has a nice stamp on it. And we might look at how those work later. And this is just a suggestion. You could easily find other things in your junk drawer or your sewing kit, old antique buttons. Look around your household and gather up some things. They'll be fun to play with. You also need a piece of fabric that is going to be for your work surface. I have here this cotton piece. You could have a sheet or a pillowcase. A piece of canvas would work. Something that you can work on a non-stick surface safely. So that's our basic tools. Okay, everybody, so now we're going to move on to talk about setting up your workspace. Doesn't have to be anything fancy. It could be inside, it could be outside. And this is a non-toxic uh, sort of a situation, so working on your kitchen table is fine. The one thing you might want to think about for your personal space is whether you would prefer to stand or sit. So that would mean some considerations for the height of your table. You could even work on a fold, inexpensive folding table. And if you want that table to be higher, the trick that I learned many years ago is to buy yourself some PVC pipe and cut it to length and insert it in the legs of your table to make it higher. Just find out what works for you. Then getting down to the surface that your clay is going to go onto, a piece of cloth is good. This is just an inexpensive piece of cotton cloth. You could have an old sheet, an old pillowcase, a piece of canvas. And really the best thing, you can lay that out directly on your table, but it would be great if you had a board 
like this that you could wrap it on. This is just a piece of plywood. And you could wrap this around your board and either tape it or staple it or nail it into place. When you're done at the end of the day, you'll have your bucket to clean up with. And you just wipe that fabric off a few times and let it dry. So that's the basic work safe. All right, folks, so now we're going to be talking about the different stages with clay. And I have here in front of me examples from the very beginning of when things are made to when they're all fired. But first, let's talk about that there are many different types of clay. And you can see the great color variation here. We have here a porcelain that's a very white, smooth type of clay. And then we have uh, two tiles here that are examples of slightly not porcelain. It's a, it's a little beige, and it has a material in it that we call grog or sand, which um, helps with building and shrinkage. And then a brown clay and a red clay. So clay comes in a lot of varieties. Those are some types of clay. Then I have a few other projects out here on the table to give you examples of the different stages of clay. At first, you have wet, very pliable clay. As it starts to dry, it's called leather hard. And before it's fired even the first time, the piece is called uh, bone dry. It, and these two pieces are greenware because they have not been fired yet. When the piece is totally bone dry, that's when it's ready to go into the kiln for the first time. And it goes for the first firing, as this piece has been through. And that's called bisqueware. It's sturdier than bone dry. In fact, bone dry is the uh, most fragile stage. That's when you want to be extra careful of the handling. There's still fragility here, but not as much with the bisque piece. And it is still uh, porous, so it can accept the glaze, which we'll talk more about that in the weeks to come. And the final stage is after the piece has been glazed. It's had its color applied. And it comes out of the kiln and has all kinds of wonderful colors and is the strongest stage of clay. So that's our stages of clay, folks. OK, everybody, now we're going to move on to actually working with the clay and rolling out of your slab to get ready to go. And so your clay is going to come in a bag like this. It comes in a block of 25 pounds, and it comes all tied up. The tie is off of this bag right now, but you always want to make sure that when you're done working or even in the middle of your working, if you have clay in the bag, tie that back up well so it doesn't dry out. As you work along uh, in the future weeks and times, if you have dried scraps, you don't want to put them back in here. Get yourself another bag, spray a lot in that bag to re-moisten your clay. It's totally usable when it's moistened up again, and then tie that bag up. We will get into reclaiming the clay a little later, but you don't want to put your dried scraps back in here. So you have your 25-pound block here, and you need to cut some off so that you can roll out a slab. You know we talked earlier about having something to cut your clay with. So on this piece of fish line, that's pretty hard to see, but I tied a washer on the end of here. You could tie an old button, or here's an official clay wire that comes in a kit. You could tie it onto two old chopsticks or two little pieces of old pencil, something like that, something so that you have something to grip when you're pulling it through your clay. And here I have another washer. Gotta get this one out of the way here. And I have my strong string. I'm just going to tie it around here and do a double knot so it's not going to give way. And ideally, you want to have something at either end. But I used my other washer <laughs> on the fish line, so this one's going to be like this that I'll use. So I'm going to peel back a chunk of this. Cut off a piece of clay. Finally, we get to the clay. I'm going to cut it off thicker than I needed. It's maybe 
an inch and a half or so, I might say. You've got to pull nice and hard. You're trying to pull straight. doesn't have to be perfect, but you're hoping to pull it straight through. Then I always like to clean my string off right away so that these bits don't dry, and then they go in my water bucket. I have my thick slab. Get my clay out of the way. I see it's a little uneven. It doesn't need to be perfect, but it's plenty soft enough to flatten it down a bit before I begin rolling. I know when we talked about tools, I had these wooden slats out, but we didn't get a really good look at them earlier. So when you're going to use these, you're going to start with them thicker ones. This is still a little thick to my liking to start rolling, so I'm turning it over and flattening it down. You can also flatten it by throwing it, but if I throw this on the table right now, it's going to make a loud bang, which I don't want to subject you to, so I'll just use my hands. Get your fabric stretched out so you don't have wrinkles underneath. And if I had this wrapped around a board, that would make sure there wouldn't be any wrinkles. Then I'm going to put these on either side. And I'm going to use a nice big rolling pin here. If you have a big rolling pin, that's great. If you don't, then you want to cut your chunk a little thinner than I started out with. So I'm going to roll. This is nowhere near the thickness. We're going for a finished thickness of about three-eighths of an inch. I don't know if you notice, but when I turned this, here's what I did. It was facing this way. Now I'm turning it in another direction. That's good to do when you're rolling out clay. It helps those molecules compress in different directions. When this glides evenly, over my wooden slats here and the rolling pin starts to hit those slats evenly, then I know I have achieved the thickness and we're almost there. One more flip. And the smoother your fabric that you have underneath, the smoother the surface of your clay is going to be. Okay, so if I want to go a little thinner, I remove these, and I move on to these slats, which are a little thinner. You can also do this with dowels of different thicknesses. So this clay, fresh out of the bag, is wonderful when you're using reclaim, or sometimes when it's fresh out of the bag, there are issues. So that thickness is good. If, th if there were any uh, wrinkles or issues, let's see if I got any wrinkles on the back. Well, I'm going to make it wrinkle because I want to show you something. Don't do this on purpose, but if it happens, I'm going to show you how to deal with this. By the way, you always want to work with a wooden rolling pin. You don't want plastic or uh, marble or anything like that, and that's because your rolling pin is a non-stick surface if it's wooden. Those others are going to have a problem. So here's where I force that wrinkle into it. I'm going to take my uh, rib, which is actually a gift card, and I'm going to compress the surface here. When you're compressing with a rib, you don't want to hold it vertical. That's going to dig into the clay. You want to put it at an angle. And I like to do these X formations because it compresses in different directions. Some clay will gather up on the back of your rib. That's normal. Don't worry about that. Then you get it back smooth. So if you get any wrinkles or bumps, that'll take care of it. Again, the little bits go in the water. Now, sometimes you'll have an air pocket in your clay. You want to get rid of that also. And the way you notice an air pocket is, there'll be a little hump in your clay. I don't think I have any here, but if you do, you want to get rid of those. So I'm going to pretend I have one just to show you. So if I had an air pocket right here, I would attack it with my knife. 
hit it a few times, and then I squeeze a teeny bit of water there. And the reason I'm squeezing water over the top is I want the water to displace where the air was, but just a little bit of water. Then I go back and compress. Just a word of warning, folks, that when you do that, if you have a big air bubble and, and you compress the way I did, sometimes you get a bunch of little air bubbles. Then you can go back and compress again. Repeat those steps. Stab it with a knife, dampen it with your sponge, and compress. So we want to take those out. So then we have our slab, it's all prepared, but maybe we're not ready to work with it, but we need to move it so we can work with some of the clay. The thing about clay is it has its own kind of memory. So I like to demonstrate that by saying, if you lift up the corner of this slab like that and leave it like that, and then you gently pat it down, if you walked away, the clay's gonna remember that you did that and it's gonna eventually roll back up some. So you want to handle your clay very carefully, almost as if you're not. Some people call that how you would handle a baby bird. You want to handle it carefully and as little as possible. So when I want to transport this onto a board, if I have to lift it off, I can. But my preferred method, I'm going to show you folks here, is to take your fabric Put your board on top, tape your fabric, and put your hand underneath, and then flip it. That way you're not doing any handling. If you have to pick it up, you want to gently lift it and move it. But if you can work in a situation where you can flip it over like that, that's ideal. And then you just peel away your fabric and move that off to dry. Now we have this nice slab, needs a little compression right here. And this compression step, it's one of those steps that may not look like you're doing anything, but the fact of the matter is, compressing helps your slab to dry evenly and not warp. So get used to doing that, it's helpful. Now, in preparing to move forward with your clay, it's good to practice cutting the clay carefully and make yourself a couple of tiles. So I'm not going to measure here, but I'm going to cut through on my board. Whatever surface your board is, remember you want it to be a non-stick surface. This would go in my bag for later. And I'm going to cut two tiles. I like to cut away this extra strip here, so it makes it easier to access my piece that I want. And say about four inches square or something, does not have to be exact. But again, you want to be gentle when you move these. And this might be a good time to make some marks in your clay with some of these found objects. So try them out, see what you like, see what you don't. You can stamp inside of things. I always find the clothespin to be interesting because there's so many different ways to approach this and make so many different marks. So this is a fun time to play. You could have a border or you could have an interior. Okay, folks, so now we have your two tiles. And I just did a little bit of texturing on here, but I want you to keep in mind that these tiles are going to be glaze tests later on down the road. So it would be good for the surface on both of these to reflect how you think you want your work to be. So if you want to have a lot of texture in your work, do that on the tiles because then we'll have good test tiles, if you will, for testing out the glazes. Now we're going to be keeping one drying on a board in the air like this. Your second piece, you're going to use a thin plastic such as this, like dry cleaner plastic, to wrap it. 
You don't want a heavy plastic like these bags here. You want a thinner plastic. And we are going to wrap this up totally in the plastic, not handling it very much, but completely wrapped up on here. And I want you during the upcoming days to be checking on these and notice how they're drying. What parts of it are drying faster? Pick them up, examining them. So let's observe these and learn about what's best practices for drying our pieces. And we'll check on those next time out. So uh, one other thing I want to say about that is the drying properties are going to change as the climate changes in your workspace. If you have a window open, if it's hot, if it's damp, all of those kind of things are factors in the drying. So keep that in the back of your mind too. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about some other things that will help you in working with slabs and building with fresh clay. I make a lot of templates myself, sometimes out of cereal boxes, sometimes out of file folders. Any kind of boxes like this that has flexible plastic, you can make a cylinder shape out of this, but you can also cut templates into shapes. So this particular one, a little bit like a Starbucks cup, would make a cone shape. So these kind of materials are easily gotten and are very useful. But there's lots of other things when you're slab building. If you build inside a form, like this plastic form, this bamboo dish, or even inside a wok makes a great mold. When you build in like that, it's called a slump mold. If you were building over the top, which you could also do here on this wok, it would be called a hump mold. That's just clay terminology. So if you are building inside of plastic or any form that your clay is gonna stick to, you wanna be careful of that because if your project sticks inside this form, it's gonna crack when it dries. There's a couple of ways to approach that. And one good way that I use is using strips of newspaper. And something I learned many years ago is that newspaper has a grain to it. It's gonna rip in this direction very well. So I'm gonna rip a couple of those. But if you rip crossways, it doesn't rip straight. So if you want to rip straight, you have to rip with the newspaper grain. So you don't want to put a big piece of newspaper in here because it's going to crumple and make wrinkles on the bottom of your clay. So you would lay strips here till you cover the surface. And another advantage to using newspaper like this and not using plastic, which I have seen people do, is while your project is drying on top, it's also drying underneath because the newspaper is observing, absorbing some of the moisture. If you have plastic under there, it's gonna sweat. Another practice that some people do that is also toxic, non-toxic, excuse me, that is also non-toxic and safe is to use cornstarch. So the cornstarch would be placed in instead of the newspaper. But you wouldn't sprinkle the cornstarch onto the dish because it's gonna fall in. You would take your slab when you have it formed and you would sprinkle lightly. You can even lightly brush it on onto the surface of the clay and then the cornstarch surface would go in here. So you can use a lot of these forms you can check in your kitchen cabinet for different shapes you might have. You can even use a dish that's already fired. And I would do the same thing here with either the cornstarch or the newspaper. One thing that's nice about using this newspaper is once you get this covered, you can rip off some of this excess or cut off some of the excess. But if you have your strips, I'm not covering the whole thing, but you would need to cover the whole thing. If your strips are extending beyond your dish, when it's dry enough to handle, that's when it's firm, you can just lift up a little bit here and you'd be able to get your hand under your piece and lift it off of the dish. And again, this is a shallow slump mold. 
So that's another thing you can do. Cardboard tubes are great. Sometimes you can get these from fabric stores because sometimes fabric comes on bolts of fabric. But if that's not possible, another great thing is to use PVC pipe, which is inexpensive, and the PVC pipe comes in a lot of different dimensions. It is not non-stick, though. So if you use PVC pipe, you want to cover it with newspaper like this so that your clay project doesn't stick. So that's a little bit about templates and forms for all those great projects you can do with slabs. Okay, here I have my bag of clay scraps. So we're going to talk about reclaiming or recycling your clay. But I want to go back over for a minute a little bit about the different stages of clay. So when you first work with your slabs or any style of making projects with clay, your clay is wetware. It's also referred to as greenware. But greenware goes through different stages. So at first, it's very soft, wetware. As it dries and gets firm, but still the same color when you first made it, it's leather hard. You think of a leather belt. It might be a little bit flexible, but it has some structural integrity. As it's completely dry, it's called bone wear. All the way up into that point, your clay can become a scrap and be reclaimed. When it goes into the kiln for the first time and it goes through what we call the bisque firing, once it comes out of the bisque firing, you can no longer reclaim. And it has to be fired in a kiln because you're firing up to around 1800 degrees. Your oven won't do it. If you don't have a kiln at home, most places have community art store uh, studios or there are stores that will do firing for you. If you don't have access to firing at the moment, you can still store your work all the way along that time, even when it's bone dry. Just remember that the bone dry work is the most fragile. So if you're transporting it, you need to cushion it well and ideally, if you have those ideal circumstances, you'd want to transport it when it's leather hard. But let's get to these scraps. So I got a bunch of scraps tied up in my bag so they don't dry out. And this is what I do at home in my studio. So we need to get these rejuvenated so that this clay can be usable again. And that's one of the great things about clay is you can reuse it. So generally, I'll take a bunch of my scraps and I just kind of squish them together to make a lump. And I am going to do something that we call wedging. And I'll show you a couple of different ways to do that. So initially, the surface is going to be, the surface of this mound, if you will, is going to be a little too soft to deal with. So I'll roll it around. I'll scrape my board off. Remember, you're working on a non-stick surface. I'll just start pushing it around a little bit to dry it out. The goal is to get this to be a solid mass, like how the clay is when you get it fresh out of the bag, without air pockets and without parts that are drier or wetter than others. Move her on to a drier part of my surface here. And the term we use is wedging. And that's to take the air bubbles out. I'll show you a couple of different ways. And if you're not able to do this at first, don't worry. Just get it into a mass. So one kind of wedging we call ram's head wedging. Because as I rock this and roll it on itself, see it's drying now it start to look like a bit of a ram's head. And if you are getting into this, it's good practice to learn. 50 strokes is what I was taught is good to get it even. That's one method. Now another method is called spiral wedging. So on the ram's head wedging, we're working off of a plane, a line. With the spiral wedging, we're working off of a point. So you're going to make it more into a cone, and you turn it. Again, don't fret about this. 
The last method I'm not going to demonstrate because it's very loud, <laughs> but I will sh talk about it because it's really very easy. You would cut your clay up into chunks, small slices if you will, and one at a time you would throw them down hard on the work surface, one on top of the other, and then cut it in a different direction. You'd go back and forth and do that a few times. We officially call that the slice and slam method, and that works also. So don't worry if you can't do those other methods. No matter what, when you are done and you have rejuvenated your clay, remember you want to get it back in your bag and tie your bag up well. And that's the great thing about clay is that we can recycle it. So that's it about reclaiming your clay. Okay, after all this work, let's talk about cleanup. So, you know, it is non-toxic what we're working with, but clay dust has something called silica in it, and it's really not good to breathe that. So depending on your situation, if you're messy or if you're in a space that other people are gonna be using, like your kitchen, you might wanna put down a sheet of plastic. You can get great big sheets of plastic that they use as uh, plastic drop cloths for painting at Home Depot and such places. In fact, some of those plastic sheets are thin enough for wrapping your clay, but you could certainly put one of those down on the floor. And if I was doing that, I would take that and fold it in on itself and then maybe take it outside to spray it with a hose or wipe it down with a sponge. Don't even bother with it in your house <coughs> where you're working. And any of the cleanup you wanna do with things being moist or wet. You don't wanna be scraping dust and that sort of things on your table or on your floor. So have a container of water, no soap is needed. Wipe your tools off really well. Set them aside to dry, maybe on your work board. Clean everything off. And what I do then is I just leave this bucket of water sitting in my studio, set it aside in your home somewhere, out of harm's way from young children or cats or whatever. And then when you let this set out, after you've cleaned everything off, the water will rise to the surface and you can pour that off. That slush that's in the bottom, if it's thick, get yourself a little container with a lid that's gonna turn into something we call slip. But you don't wanna put that down your drain. And if you don't wanna save it at all, you could put that slush in a plastic bag and tie it up and put it in your trash, that's fine. But you always wanna clean up at the end of the day so things don't get dusty and dry and be prepared for a nice clean workspace the next time that you start out wearing an apron also a good idea. These aprons that I wear in my studio, they never go in my house. I just take those and I rinse those in a big bucket and then hang them up to dry. If I can't get them clean enough that way, I always rinse that way first, then it might go through the washing machine. But an apron's a good thing to have also, and maybe a rag to have nearby to wipe your hands off from time to time. So that way your space does not get too dirty and everything's ready to go the next time out.